All right, so we are continuing our quest to understand what COVID models are and how they work. Uh, and in our last video, uh, we started with a very basic model where every seven days the infected population doubled, and then we jumped from there to something called the SIR model, which is a very basic model that's used uh, to kind of describe the way that disease spreads through a population. And it has everybody in the population broken down into three groups. So you are either susceptible, infected, or recovered or removed. So susceptible is people who can get the disease. Infected are people that have it and can spread it. And recovered or removed are people who have had the disease and cannot get it again. So that includes people who are both immune as of, uh, by the fact that they had the disease already and also people who have died. And because you are dead, you cannot pass on the disease. So what we want to do now is we want to plug in some numbers into this model in order to make it work, in order to put it to use. So where do these numbers come from? So the big process that we want to deal with here are how people move between these different compartments. How does someone move from susceptible to infected? And how does someone move from infected to recovered? So those are the only two processes that can happen. So we have susceptible to infected, that's one. And then the other one is going to be infected to remove. There are other models that have more complicated processes that go on where uh, recovered people can become susceptible again, but for the SIR model, it's just susceptible to infected and infected to recovered. So right now in New York City, we are not supposed to go outside. We are not supposed to form groups of people, and that is because the more people that we interact with, the greater our chances that we will catch the coronavirus. The idea behind that is there are two things that are going to happen. Uh, number one, if I am infected, the more people that I have contact with, the more people I'm capable of spreading it to. Or if I'm susceptible, the more people that I interact with, the more likely it is that someone who's infected will interact with me, I'll catch the disease, and then I'll be able to spread it to other people. So if we want to talk about the most basic idea behind one of the numbers here, we are going to look at the contact rate. So the contact rate is the rate at which susceptible people and infected people come into contact with one another. Along with that though, one of the reasons why coronavirus is a difficult thing that requires things like lockdown uh, is along with having a uh, contact rate, you know, if I sit inside, I don't have contact with anyone, then you know, I definitely won't catch it. Um, but some diseases, it's very difficult to transfer between people. So I could talk to you, I could hang out with you, but I won't catch the disease or you won't catch the disease from me. Whereas other things like the flu are very, very contagious and it's easy to catch it from other people. So along with contact rate, um, the risk of infection is another number that we're going to need to pay attention to. So the contact rate is how often do infected and susceptible people come in contact. And then the risk of infection is during one of those contacts, what is the chance of spreading the disease? Pretty simple, right? Um, so in order for you to be susceptible and then become infected, you both have to have contact with someone who is infected and have a risk of infection that successfully infects you. So let's see how these two numbers combine from a math standpoint. So let's say we have a 100% risk of infection uh, and I meet one person every day. This is me being uh, an infected person. So if I have a 100% risk of infection and I meet one person every day, the math behind that is going to be uh, one person times a 1.0 risk of infection, so that is 1 times 1.0, and there we go, we have a, what you might think is a 100% risk of infection, um, but let's say that on that one day, when I meet that one person, I definitely infect them. So every single day, I'm infecting one person. Let's switch that up a little bit. Let's say there's a 50% risk of infection, 
Uh, and every single day, I meet one person every day. So in this case, it's one person times my 50% risk of infection. So one times 0 0.5 uh, gives me 0 0.5. Now, you might think of this as I had a 50% chance of infecting that person. You can also think of this as I infected 0 0.5 people that day. These two seem kind of different, kind of similar. Um, we're going to see the problem with them, though, right now. So 50% risk of infection, I meet one person every day, which means that on average, I infect 0.5 people every day. Let's say I have a 25% risk of infection, so a little bit lower than the ones before, but I meet 10 people every day. How does that one work out? So that's 10 people times my 0 0.25 risk of infection. So that's 10 times 0 0.25, which gives me 2.5. Now before, you might have been thinking of this as this is a 100% chance of infecting that person. This is a 50% chance of infecting that person. You do not have a 250% chance of doing anything in this world because percentages will top out at 100% or 1.0 probability. Uh, what this number means is that if I meet 10 people every day and I have a 25% risk of infection, we are going to say, on average, I infect 2.5 people every day. Now we can actually even take on average out of there because this is a basic model, on average is kind of built into these assumptions. So in this case, I'm going to infect 2.5 of the 10 people I meet every day. And you might say something like, so much, this is stupid, you're an idiot. Uh, you cannot infect 2.5 people. People generally come in holes. And if you infect half of a person, they are probably removed anyway because you have sawed them in half. But in the same way that an American family can have 2.4 children or whatever, you can infect 2.5 people. Because this is a statistical model, this is not about the exactitude of exactly how many people. Uh, you're gonna have to roll with 2.5 people being okay. All right, so far we have thought about this as being every single day. I go out, I meet one person, I meet 10 people. What if it turns out that I'm not doing this, I'm not meeting one person every day? So first we'll say 50% uh, risk of infection, uh, one person a day. We did this one already. Uh, that is going to be one person a day times 0 0.5, right? So I infect 0.5 people every day. But what if instead of one person every day, I still have that 50% risk of infection, but instead I'm meeting one person every week. So this ends up being slightly different um, because instead of one person every day, it's one person every week. So do we have to, you know, do you say one times 0 0.5 because you're saying it's one person every week, 50% risk of infection, and this is a 50% chance every week? No. We are trying to keep all of these in terms of single days. That is the unit we are using for our analysis every single day. So if we meet one person every week, how many people do we meet every day? In the same way that we can infect 2.5 people every day or 0.5 people every day, we can meet less than one person every day. And it turns out that one person every week is just going to be one seventh of a person every day. So my math is going to be one divided by seven for one person every seven days by my 0 0.5 risk of infection. And that will give me about a 0 0.07 person people that I will infect every day. So I infect about 0 0.07 people every day. And you say, Soma, this is even worse than the 2.5 people. This is far worse than the 0.5 people. 
but the, it's just how models work. You are going to have to live with it. So uh, when we are talking about these numbers here, um, this number of people we infect every day, the 0.07, the 0.5, uh, the 2.5, this number is called the effective contact rate. So it's the number of contacts that will effectively infect another person. So uh, the contacts that will effectively infect another person. It's also thought of as the idea where if you threw an infected person into a room of susceptible people, uh, how many people would they end up infecting in a day? Um, so generally speaking, this is a beta in terms of symbols. I don't know how to write a beta. Can I do this? Nope. Can I put crazy braces around it and make it like a LaTeX or something? Nope, never gonna work. Okay. So just know that if you ever see the Greek symbol beta in epidemiology, it might be the effective contact rate. So this is moving from susceptible to infected. This is, let's say, um, the big number for moving from susceptible to infected. But remember that effective contact rate itself, even though it's the number that's important, it is based on the contact rate and the risk of infection. This contact rate, not the effective contact rate because an infected person and a susceptible person can meet one another, um, but the effective contact rate is the one where they successfully pass disease between the two of them. Now, next up, we have moving from infected to removed. So moving from infected to removed is a little bit easier. Um, so there are two ways to move from infected to removed. Uh, number one, you can get better. You can get healed and now you have antibiotic antibodies and you cannot become infected again. Uh, and the other one is that you die and then you are no longer part of the susceptible pool. You can uh, no longer part of the infected pool either. Uh, you cannot infect other people. The way this works is we start from a recovery period. So the recovery period covers both getting better and dying. A uh, unit of time for how long it takes to recover, or even just how long it takes to recover. <clears throat> so let's say I have a uh, recovery period of four days. So if I have a recovery period of four days, what we're going to do is we're going to say one divided by four. On any given day, about a quarter of the people, or exactly a quarter of the people in our model, are going to be recovering. This is called the removal rate. So it is 1 divided by our recovery period. This is the rate at which people stop being infected. So for example, uh, let's say our recovery period is four days and uh, we have 100 sick people on day 11. Well, if we do, what is our removal rate? So if our recovery period is four days, we do one divided by four. If we want to see, let's say we have 100 sick people on day 10, um, how many recover on day 11? What we do is we take those 100 people and then we multiply them by our removal rate and 25 infected people are removed on day 11. Uh, let's try it again. I mean, this is pretty simple, but if our recovery period is 10 days uh, and we have 200 sick people on day 10 how many recover on day 11 so what is our removal rate well if our recovery period 
is 10 days, our removal rate is going to be one divided by 10. And in order to see how many people recover on the day after we have 200 people, we're gonna take those 200 infected people and we're gonna multiply them by one over 10, our removal rate. And so on day 11, we have 20 people move from infected to recovered. Done and done, that's amazing, right? So what we have done is we have figured out how to move between each of these compartments. So we've figured out how people move from susceptible to infected. We figured out how people move from infected to recovered. So susceptible to infected takes the contact rate and the risk of infection. It combines it using this math here to turn it into the effective contact rate. And if we go from infected to removed, simple math, we just divide out the recovery period by one. Uh, so four days give us a 0.25. So next video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at how to combine these two numbers into R0, which is a very popular, popular uh, technical phrase that has been used a lot when describing coronavirus and other epidemics.